Good evening and welcome to the Bible study of the Abundant Love Church. Delighted that you have tuned in this evening. Uh, we have entitled our Bible study Disciples Academy because Jesus tells us to go into all the world and make disciples. So uh, we are encouraged uh, by your participation tonight. And uh, we're going to sing a song here, have a few announcements, sing one more song, and go right into our lesson. Lord Almighty God, we serve. Lord Almighty God, we serve. Oh, Lord Almighty God, we serve. Let the word of the Lord be anointed. 
Let it be full of truth that it may deliver the hearer and cause freedom to each and every believer. We pray for our nation today. We pray for the unrest in our streets. We pray for the families of those that have lost loved ones to violence and to coronavirus. We pray, oh God, that you would send the comforter. Let him do his work and fill that empty void with the love of God. We pray, Father, for our leadership, our president, for all those advisors that speak to him. We pray for wise counsel, godly counsel, and for decisions that will bless and benefit the people. I pray, oh God, now that as we look into your word tonight, that you would help us to glean the truth of your word that would cause us to be better brothers, better sisters, better saints of God. Now we ask your blessings upon us in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. God bless you today. Just a few announcements here. You'll probably know them by heart now. Support your ministry. And support your ministry. If your ministry is meeting on the parking lot, if it's meeting in uh, social distance settings, uh, if you can support with your attendance, support with your attendance. Amen. Support with your prayers. Certainly the man of God and the church need your prayers. I uh, want you to uh, support financially with your tithe and with your offering so that the work of the ministry can continue. Um, uh, it's just good uh, to be supportive. Uh, come alongside, strengthen and support. Uh, also remember fellowship of the saints. Uh, it's kind of unusual now because uh, the Bible tells us not to forsake assembling and it's been a period of time where we haven't been able to assemble but just because you can't assemble does not mean you cannot fellowship there's so many avenues that you can fellowship with they got uh, zoom and facebook and video calls and facetime and uh, text messages, Twitter. I mean, you got, you have so many ways, and, and if none of those ways work for you, you can always pick the telephone up and dial those. I started to say seven numbers, but you got to dial ten numbers now to get hold of somebody and let them know that you think about them, let them know that you care, because love really isn't love unless you give it away. So you have to spread the love of God to to your fellow parishioners. The Bible tells us to be hospitable especially to the household of faith. And so uh, that's my encouragement for you tonight. Thank you for tuning in here tonight, uh, this evening rather, for our Bible study. We stream three times a week. Uh, we stream on Sunday morning, a Sunday school lesson at 9.30 a.m. And then we have a morning worship uh, at 11. And then, of course, here on Wednesday evening at 6.30, we stream this Bible study. would also like to mention uh, that if you have a comment or a question, uh, if you type that comment in the comment area of the Facebook page, uh, we'll have it manned. And if we have time permitted at the end, we will address the statement or the comment that you have or the question. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Last but not least, um, if you can't watch at the scheduled times for our stream, the streams are archived in two places. They are archived on the Abundant Love Facebook page. So you can just kind of scroll through them. All of them are there. Um, and if you uh, prefer, you can go to the YouTube channel, AL Ministries, and they're all archived there. All the live streams, all of the motivating moments are there. So hopefully you can find something that will encourage you and edify your faith. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. I think uh, I think that's all I have this evening. Uh, we'll sing one more song here and then we'll go uh, back into our study on the necessity of love. More than anything. More than how many love the Lord more than anything? We'll do a short version of. I lift my hands in total adoration unto you. You reign on the throne, for you are God and God alone. Because of you, my cloudy days are gone. I can sing. I 
just want to say that I love you more than anything. My hands in total adoration unto you. You reign on the throne, for you are God and God alone. Because of you, my cloudy days are gone. I can sing. sustain you through each and every day and so I love the word because it's living it's alive the Bible says that the word of God is, is quick it's powerful 
sharper than any two-edged sword. And so it's able to do exactly what the Lord has sent it to do because he never sends his word and it doesn't accomplish what he sent it to do. It never returns void. It always hits its mark. And so we pray tonight that uh, the word of the Lord will hit its mark with you today. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. Uh, here in the month of August, as we finish up here tonight, we've been talking about uh, the necessity of love. And we found that home-based scripture in uh, the book of St. John, uh, verse number 34 of the 13th chapter. St. John 13, verse number 34 and 35. And it says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as, just like, I have loved you, that you also love one another. Then verse 35 says, by this, by what? By the way we love each other. By this shall all men know, not just people in the church, but people outside of the church will know that we are disciples of Christ if we have love one to another. And so love is absolutely necessary. It is uh, an essential part of the Christian walk and the Christian life. And then on last week, and I won't read it again, but I would certainly encourage you to read the 13th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. And what you'll find is that from verses uh, approximately 4 to 7, 4 to 8 in that vicinity, you'll find a very descriptive uh, uh, expose of what love should be, what Christian love is. And on last week, uh, we pulled out 21 points out of those four verses that describes love. Last week, we went over 10 of them. Hopefully, we'll go over the last 11 tonight. Uh, I will, for repeat and for review sake, I'll mention the first 10, but hopefully I won't elaborate much on them because I want to get to the second set. And uh, just don't take my word for it. You can go to 1 Corinthians 13 and uh, the 12th chapter before it talks about the demonstration and the working of gifts. But in the Corinthian church, they had some, you know, they, they always had a ruckus going on in the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church sound like the church today. You always got something to kind of deal with. But the word addresses everything. And so in the Corinthian church, they're having this discussion about who has the best gift, and I prophesy, and I speak in tongue, and, and, and these sorts of things. And what Paul was trying to tell them is that it's really not a contest. You all are supposed to work together to get it done. But if you really want to know the most effective way to represent Christ, he said, I'll show you a more excellent way. And then he goes into chapter 13, and he gives all these great descriptive terms about the love of God and how that love should operate in the saints of God. So uh, in your time, in your personal reading, your personal time, uh, go ahead and look at 1 Corinthians 13. And I am sure it's not, um, it's a good measuring stick for your love. It'll show you where you hit the mark, and then it'll show you the places where you need to kind of, you know, uh, uh, make some improvements, if I can say it like that. Um, so, uh, I'm going to read the introduction here, and then I'll rehearse those 10, and then we'll go into the second 11. The introduction says that love is the staple of the Christian faith. Uh, it's absolutely essential, and it is indispensable as it relates to representing God. But the love of God through Christianity is and should be unique. That is, it shouldn't be uh, common. It should be easily distinguishable from what the world identifies as love. The world's version of love and Christian love, they should be, e I mean, Christian love should be easily identified because of the unique features of the love of Christ. Uh, the love of Christ, or the love of God, it has dynamic characteristics that make it easily recognizable as it identifies the followers of Jesus Christ. And so this evening, we're going to go into that list in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. And verse 10, I'll just briefly uh, touch them. Love is patient. That is, love is not in a hurry. Love is not full of anxiety. 
Love is patient in its working. Love is kind. It is courteous. It has compassion. Uh, it's not mean. You're not rough. Uh, love is not envious. It's not jealous uh, over somebody else's success or somebody else's possession. Love uh, has uh, humility to it. It's not puffed up. It's not arrogant. It doesn't boast or promote itself. Uh, number five, love is respectful. And uh, I have learned that if you want respect, you have to give respect. Uh, everybody deserves respect, but it, it shouldn't be something uh, that any person is absent of because everybody is made in the image of God. The easiest way to get respect is to give respect. And the Bible tells us as much. It says, don't be deceived. Don't be fooled by this. God isn't mocked. It would be mockery to God if you don't reap what you sow. So, and that's not meant to scare you for the bad things that you can reap. It's meant to encourage you for the good things that you should sow. Because when you sow these good things, you can expect them to come back to you. And then I heard a preacher say, and I love the way he put it. He said, you sow a seed. He said, but you don't reap a seed. He said, anytime you plant and sow a seed, you get a tree producing fruit whose seed is in itself that reproduces after its kind. So you always reap more than you sow. So you want to sow good seeds. So, uh, love is respectful. It honors and it gives respect. It doesn't put people to shame. It doesn't humiliate people, but it thinks the best of them and tries to lift them to the highest place. Number six, love is selfless. That is, it's not selfish. It's not always looking out for number one, what it can get out of, out of the deal and, 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 you know, putting itself first. And in fact, uh, the Bible tells us to honor and prefer one another. Number eight, love, or rather number seven, love is calm. Uh, it's, you know, it's not always a 911. It's not always edgy. It's not always anxious and overbearing. Uh, but it's calm. It's patient. It's kind. It's consistent. Number eight. Love is righteous, and love has to be righteous because love proceeds from God, and God is righteous. So in its, in, its, in its purest form, love is always seeking the right of the individuals involved. Number nine, love is honest, and that goes along with righteous. That is, it's transparent, it's true, it's up front. Um, it, it, I, I almost hesitate to use this, but I will use it love. It is what it is. It's exactly what God said it is. And so it's honest. Uh, number 10, love protects. And um, all you have to do is look at a father with his children. Um, the father will go to the wall to protect his children. No, not just fathers, mothers. So let me say parents. Parents will go to the wall to protect their children. And it's, it's a natural arm of love. Um, I read an article some years ago, um, used to be a columnist named uh, Irma Bombeck, and she intimated a story about how we trade prices. And she was talking about when she was a little girl, she was riding in the car with her mother, her mother was driving, and a car pulled out in front of them, and she instinctively, as she hit the brakes, put her arm over to protect her child. And then years later, when her mother is aged and up in age, her mother is riding in the passenger seat, and she's driving. A car pulls out in front of her. When she hits the brake, she instinctively, I mean, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to plan it. Love protects. You want to protect the people that you love. And so the love of God, when he gives us laws, when he gives us commandments, it's never to restrict us or control us or treat us like robots. Every law that God gives us is to protect us, protect protect our rights, and to protect the rights of others. And so love protects. And so that's a quick version of that 10. I'm going to go on to the next 11 and hopefully finish here in the next 25 or 30 minutes. Number 11, love is trusting. That is, true love trust. It relies and depends on you. It recognizes your abilities, your talents, your skills, and the good things in you. Every real good loving relationship is based on trust. Now, true enough, we have to trust God with everything. And as we learn the people of God, we have to give them arenas that they are trustworthy in. But it is impossible to love without trusting people. 
Well, pastor, people are not perfect and they're going to make mistakes. You are absolutely right and that includes you. But still, trust has to be the basis of the relationship because if trust is the basis of the relationship, then the relationship doesn't fall apart when a weakness is revealed. So trust has to be there. And when you have trust, uh, you know, now I've never done this, but I've seen this done uh, in many corporations and businesses. Uh, they'll put a person, um, uh, stand him out on the floor and tell him to fall backwards when he got two or three people behind him. He literally has to trust those people behind him to catch him. Now that's a very crude example, but that's the way it is uh, with your sisters and your brothers. Okay, you have to know their talents, you got to know their abilities, and then you have to trust them in the arena that God has gifted them in. And, and, and I believe that uh, it's a true sign of Christian love where we not only are looking to express our own talents, but we are appreciating the talents of others. So love uh, is trusting. Number 12, love is hopeful. I, this one, I, I, I probably love this one out of all of them. Um, because I'm an optimist. No matter what goes on, I'm always trying to look and see God in it. I'm trying to look on the good side of it. And love, when it's hopeful, it's, it's optimistic. It's always looking, even though there may be a, a trying or a challenging situation, they're still looking for God to show himself strong in the midst of that challenge. Somebody said uh, that a setback is a setup for a comeback. So anytime God puts you in a place uh, where you can't help yourself, it's a place where he can help you and get all the glory out of it. And so you don't lose hope. You don't quit. You don't give up on God. You keep hope alive and you're optimistic. You are full of faith that the Lord is going to perform his word. Now, he didn't promise. Okay, I, I searched. I looked. The Lord never promised that we wouldn't get sick. Amen. Some great men in the Bible got sick, had illnesses, but the Lord did promise to heal us from our diseases. And so when you know the promises of God, you can trust him. And when you trust him, you can be hopeful. You can be optimistic. You can be full of faith, knowing that God will perform his word. Um, uh, it's hopeful. Uh, it, 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 it is included in the plans of God, and when you know you're in the plan of God, you are always looking for a bright future. can't quote it verbatim, but it talks about uh, the way of the righteous being as a, 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 a day that shines brighter and brighter as you go into it. And so, um, uh, Dad Griffin says, uh, the best is yet to come. And so that's kind of the way it is with the Lord. The more we walk with him, there are better things in store for us up the road. And so uh, we're looking for uh, an optimistic end. Uh, Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, I know my thoughts towards you. Their thoughts are good. They're not, they're not evil thoughts. I want to give you a future. I want to give you an expected end. In other words, you can put hope and expectation in the destination and the end that God has provided and designed for you. And so love uh, is hopeful. Number 13, love is persistent. That is, love doesn't give up easily. And I want to kind of hammer this point home because during your Christian walk, uh, you will have many uh, frustrating, challenging, uh, sometimes depressing things happen to you. Uh, God never promised that if you got saved, that all of your troubles would be over. In fact, he promises just the opposite. He says, they that live godly, you shall suffer persecution. You're going to have some tough times when you're on the Lord's side. Uh, it's not always going to be sunny. Amen. You're going to have some days of rain. Uh, um, you know. I look at the life of Paul. You know, Paul is a great apostle, wrote so many books, but Paul had some tough days. Uh, uh, you know, in prison many times, beaten with 40 strikes three times, left out in the deep a day and a night. Uh, um, uh, in one place he was preaching, they got so mad at his preaching that they shaved their heads and made a pact, said, we gonna kill him. And so uh, they put him in a basket, and let him down the wall out of the city. Uh, in Lystra, they stoned him and left him for dead. And he got up. You know, Paul. You know, Paul went through some things. 
But even though you go through some things, the love of God persisted. That same city that stoned Paul and left him for dead, he got up. I believe God raised him from the dead. Got up, nursed his wounds, and went back and preached in that city again. So um, love is persistent. It doesn't give up real easy. And when you really look, if I had to use an example, I'd probably use a mother's love. Mother loves the child when everybody else has given up on the child. That child can go way out somewhere. You know, uh, I, I've heard stories of, uh, of, of, you know, wayward teenagers that got, you know, got put out the house or got came in later than the curfew. And when they knock on the door, dad said, I'm not going to the door. And, and mom, uh, you know, she'll lay there for a while, but she'll ease out of the bed and go. And, and, and let him in because it's a persistent love. It's a love that doesn't quit. It's a love that doesn't give up. And who more than the Lord Jesus Christ has proven to us that his love is persistent? It says uh, in Matthew, I believe, it says that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And it talks about uh, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage, and that's the New Testament account. But if you go back to the Old Testament account, uh, there's a slightly different account that they give in Genesis, and, and it goes something like this. It says, uh, the only thought of man was evil continually, and it repented God that he had made man. Man had become so corrupt in his ways that God looked down and he was considering the end of all flesh. Instead of waiting until, uh, you know, until, you know, the coming of the Lord, the second end, he was, he was thinking about ending man right there. He was going to destroy all humanity. But the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that grace that Noah found saved humanity so that we could repopulate the earth. And that's because the love of the Lord is persistent. It doesn't give up real easy. And it'll hang in there. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, it says it never fails. It not only hangs in there, it'll hang in there until it wins. And so um, love is absolutely persistent. Uh, number 14, love banishes fear. Love does away with fear. And that's a good thing. The Bible says that God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Fear is what works against your faith. Faith is confidence in God. Fear is when you don't have confidence in God. And so God hasn't given us a spirit that we shouldn't be confident in his word. God has given us a spirit of love, power, and sound mind. That is, we can reason it, we can believe it, and we can trust it with our innermost being. And so um, love banishes fear. True love eliminates fears. It eliminates anxieties and insecurities that torment the heart, the mind, and the soul. And uh, 1 John 4.18 says this, says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out or drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment and torment. And so the one who fears is not made perfect or is not made mature in God. So what you see is when a faith is immature, you waver in and out between trusting God's word. But when you mature, when you come to the place where you have a full-grown, well-developed, wholesome faith, it'll cast out fear because you know in every situation that the Lord has you, that the Lord will take care of you. Um, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, yes, that's the, that's the risk, that's the challenge. But he says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. And not only are you with me, you got a rod, you got a staff, and they will take care of whatever uh, comes against me. And, and the rod and the staff uh, were two of the uh, uh, tools, two of the equipment tools that a shepherd used. He would beat off uh, wolves and beat off predators with his rod. He would 
basically use it as a beating stick to keep them off the sheep. But uh, the staff with the hooked end, if the sheep got into a place that they couldn't get out of by themselves, he would reach in with that staff, hook them, and pull them out of danger. It's a funny thing about sheep. Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I've heard people say that sheep are dumb and um, I'm probably not going to say that, but I am going to say that sheep are needy. They need their shepherd. And the shepherd does so many things for the sheep. Uh, you would think that they should be able to do for themselves, but they can't. Uh, and the 23rd Psalm talks about uh, leading them to still water so that they don't drink water. It carries trash and carries debris. He said, thou anointest my head with oil and and they, the, the shepherd will anoint the nose of the sheep so that gnats and, and parasites don't fly in and set up disease. And I, I've heard that because when they're full of wool, they're top heavy. And if a sheep falls and he falls in such a way that his feet are up, he doesn't have the ability to set himself upright again. And so the shepherd always has to care. The shepherd cares for the sheep. He loves the sheep. And the sheep need the shepherd. And so love banishes fear. It, it, it makes sure that fear is gone. And when the fear is gone, you can have complete confidence in God's ability to take care of you. Number 15. Hmm, this is a good one too. Love loves even those who don't love it. When the love is real, you love people who do not necessarily love you. Jesus said it like this. He said, love your enemies. Love them. Okay. Don't get back at them. Don't strike out at them. Okay. It says, love your enemies. Uh, one verse says that if your uh, enemy is hungry, feed him. Don't starve him. <laughs> That's right. I hear you. I hear you too. Don't starve him. Feed him. And the Bible says by so doing, uh, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. And so um, love loves, love displays love to people who don't love him that. And um, that's what the love of Christ is. Uh, sinners, the Bible says that when we uh, haven't received the Lord Jesus Christ, that it's enmity against God. That is, we're an enemy of God. And so, when we walk contrary to God's word, we become an enemy of God. But, he doesn't stop loving us. He keeps reaching out for us. He keeps coming after us. Uh, the prodigal son, he takes all his money before he's supposed to have it. He goes way away into a far country where nobody can see him. The Bible just called it riotous living. He was living loose. He was living large until all his money was gone. And when he lost all his money, then he lost all his friends. When he lost his friends, he joined to the wrong place. And he ends up at the hog pen feeding hogs and almost ate what he was feeding to the hogs. But um, in the meantime, his father is going to the road every day, looking down the road for his son to come home. And that's the persistent, that is, that is a long-standing devotion of love. And so um, love, at, the, at that time, the prodigal son wasn't displaying a loving relationship to his father. But it didn't change the father's relationship. And so every day, uh, I can almost see him in my mind going to the road. He's looking down the road, uh, expecting his son to come home. And then the day he does come home, before he even gets home, the Bible says that the father seen him a long way off and started making preparation for him as he arrived. And so, uh, love loves those who do not love in return. And when we love our enemies, I'm not talking about having the warm fuzzies. Man, you ain't got to buddy up to them and travel everywhere with them. But you got to treat them cordially. You got to treat them with respect. And you got to treat them with kindness. You can't harbor ill will towards people who uh, don't necessarily feel the same about you. Number 16, love comes from God. The love we're talking about today is not something that we can manufacture by ourselves. It's not something that we can come up with. In fact, 
we don't have the capacity to love like this. And that's why this is agape love. Agape love only comes from God. It proceeds from God. And that's why it has all these great attributes because it proceeds from God. It, it's, it is the demonstration, it is the representation of who God is. True love brings you closer to God. When you accept the Lord in your life and you let the Spirit of God dwell in you and you let his nature overwrite your nature, then you start to think, you start to speak, you start to behave like God. And God can have fellowship with you because can two walk together except they be agreed. When you find a place of agreement with God, then God is ready and willing to walk with you. As long as Adam had not eaten of the tree, God walked with him every evening. In the cool of the evening, he came, walked, and had communion with Adam. And so they had communion because they had agreement. So love brings you closer to God. It brings you to a place of agreement so that you can walk with God. All right, got a few more here. We're doing good. Number 17, love makes great sacrifices. And what more can we say? Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That is, the greatest demonstration of love is giving your life for another person. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus came and he gave up his life. He said, this is the greatest, the greatest demonstration of love is when you give your life for the sparing of another life. And he not only did it uh, to please the Father, he did it for us. Um, the thief on the cross uh, says to the other thief, he says, look, man, don't you fear God? We, we're supposed to be here. This man has done nothing at all. And so innocent blood was shed in the place of guilty blood. Actually, we are the people who should have experienced the death. We are the people who should have been on the cross. But Jesus comes, he dies not just a sacrificial death, but he dies a vicarious death. That is, he dies a death in behalf of other people. And so with that sacrifice, of, I mean, what greater sacrifice uh, could he make? We're giving up everything to get to heaven. He gave up everything in heaven to come to us. We're giving up a life to get life eternal. He gave up life eternal to come and live a natural life. So his sacrifice is great. It can't be measured. And that's why uh, if you look in the book of Revelation, there's this, this book that's sealed with seven seals. And John says, I began to cry because we needed to know what was in the book, but nobody was worthy to open the book. And just about the time he started to cry, voice came out of heaven saying the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He's worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And so Jesus is in an arena. He's in a class all by himself. He didn't just die. He died for the sins of the whole world. And so that's why he deserves everybody's praise and everybody's glory. So love makes great sacrifices. Uh, God loved the world. God gave up God sacrificed. The love of God gave up Jesus. And then Jesus come, the love of Jesus gives up his life. And if we are disciples of Christ, there got to be some things we give up. We can't just, you know, it can't just be all about you. It, you have to honor, you have to prefer, you have to look out for the good of other people, and you got to share, and can I say it like this? Share a life. Uh, don't be like the man in Luke 16. You got a bumper crop and thought he would put all his goods in his barns and keep them for himself. No, he should have opened the ministry and helped the poor, helped the needy. Somebody, I mean, you can't take it all with you. Yes, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But you also ought to have some charitable giving. There ought to be a portion of your resources that are set aside for the poor, for the needy, for the desolate. For the homeless and oh, pastor, everybody's scheming now. Well, you can get around that. There, there are organizations that you can research that are doing the work that you can contribute to, and you'll get part of the credit because the homeless are everywhere. You don't have to go to a third world country to find homeless. You can go right down 
downtown in our city and find homeless people. And so there has to be a benevolence to the love of the people of God. You have to think about more than yourself. You got to think about somebody else because love makes great sacrifices. Number 18, love loves through true action. You can really define love by its action. Not a lot of talk, but watch what they do. If you really want to know if people love, don't just listen to what they say. Watch what they do because actions speak louder than words because love is not based on words. It's not based on hypocritical deeds. It is based on the truthfulness and the true motives of the action. It doesn't only believe or hope, but action is carried through. In other words, they're not just going to say I'm going to do something, they're going to follow through with the acts of love so that the love is genuine. So um, you'll see it in action. And love in action is the most powerful type of love. St. John 3.18, uh, rather 1 John 3.18 and 19 says, Dear children, love not in words, but love in deed. Uh, the, the NIV says it like this, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Love has some action to it. Uh, number 19, love loves itself. And I love this because um, it's really tough to try to love somebody else when you don't love yourself. If you've got the love of God inside of you, the first person that you learn to love is you. If God thought enough of you to love you, then ought, you ought to love yourself also. Love, this type of love is never satisfied, but it finds contentment. And there's a difference. Satisfaction means that I got it and I don't have to reach for anything else. Commitment, contentment means I'm where I am right now. There's room for improvement, but I'm, I'm appreciative, I'm thankful and grateful for what I have right now. Yes, I have some aspiration. I have some things that I want to do in the future, but I am not so concerned about the future that I don't appreciate what God has done for me today. Sometimes, Adrian, you know, aggressive, A-type personalities, they're always looking for the next mountain, always looking for the next accomplishment and the next achievement. And sometimes in their search to achieve the next thing, they don't really appreciate the thing that they've already achieved and already accomplished. So um, love uh, um, absolutely loves itself. It, it, it won't hurt itself. Uh, the Bible uh, talks about our body being the temple of the Holy Ghost, and you shouldn't abuse your body. Yes, yes, you should pamper your body. You should take care of yourself sometime, but you should really watch habits that are destructive to the body, okay? Can't stay up all night and all day and have the kind of strength and stamina that you're supposed to have. You can't make a meal, cheeseburger, Doritos, and, and you know, have a real strong response uh, from your body. You, your body is going to use what you put in it. And if you put wholesome stuff in it, you'll get wholesome things out of it. But um, you have to beware. Uh, do I have to say this? Okay. Uh, you gotta, we always talk about addictions. And when we talk about addictions, we want to talk about drugs and we want to talk about alcohol and we want to talk about things of that nature. But I want you to know something. You can be addicted to unhealthy food. You can literally make a habit of eating unhealthy meals. And the thing about unhealthy meals, they don't jump you all at once. It's the accumulative process. And then, uh, you know, we have conditions that we got to work with and got to work off, where if we have a little more discipline, oh, do I have to say this? If we had a little more discipline with the fork, we could avoid some of these problems. Now, you don't, don't take my word for it. Look at the statistics. Uh, the United States, we are a heavier nation now than we were in years past. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, great part, a great part of our uh, uh, population is considered obese. And, you know, Technology and things like that have made easier jobs for us, sit-down jobs, and a lot of times we're not using the big muscle groups, but you know what? You gotta take care of that temple. 
You got to eat right. You got to eat some good stuff. You can't drink soda pop all the time. You got to drink water sometimes. You can't. All, the, all your body trying to get out of the soda pop is the water. So why not just give it water? You got I mean, you got to eat something. You got to give the body the kind of fuel that it can work with. You got to eat. You got to sleep. You got to go to sleep. You can't stay up all night watching all the movies and watching the news. You got to get some sleep so that you get to recover so you can go through the next day and then you got to exercise. Well, Pastor, I'll just be too tired when I get home. Well, walk around the block. Walk halfway around the block. Start small. But you got to do something because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And then the Bible says, if any man defy the temple, God's going to destroy him. So, uh, not that your body is everything. Uh, they used to tell us when I was younger, bodily exercise profits little. Well, I want the little that it profit. If it's going to make me feel better, if it's going to make me look better, if it's going to make my clothes fit a little better, then I want the little exercise. And you want to get the good of it. You want to take care of the total man. And so, a love loves itself. Number 20. Uh, I got two more. Okay. Number 20. Number 20. Love binds a person's good virtues and perfect unity. That is, all the good characteristics that you have, they are tied together with love. Everything that you have must be operated in love. Uh, Galatians 5.22 says, the fruit, singular, of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. But what you find, each one of those aspects is bound in love. The, the peace is embraced by love. The long suffering, the patience is because the love is operational because love is fulfilling of the law. And the Bible says that against such there is no law because love will basically hold them all together. Love it transform you into a whole new and better person. If any man be in Christ, he is not a renovated creature not a made over creature. He's a new creature. And the thing that makes him new is because now he has a new set of values. He's got a new nature that takes him in a totally different direction. The thing I love about loving, uh, living for the Lord is this, because I can identify things that when I was in the world, I loved them. And now that I'm in the church, I don't, I don't have a desire for them anymore. Uh, the things that I used to do, the places that I used to go. I don't have a desire to do those things because God gives you a new nature and that new nature takes you in a righteous direction. Then number 21, last but not least, we've done a lot of work here in the last two weeks. Number 21 says, love gives you confidence even to face the end of time. And that is with the love of God in your heart, you don't fear the end of the world. There are a lot of people right now running scared because the pandemic is going. Nobody knows how that's going to go. You got unrest in the streets. You got upheaval. People are talking about the end of our country and things like that. They're fearing the end. Uh, this vaccine, they're talking about the mark of the beast and the antichrist. And people are afraid because they're thinking that what Revelation has said is going to come to pass. And I got news for you. You're right. It is going to come to pass. But the saint of God is not afraid of it. And the reason we're not afraid of it because we read the other part too that says he's going to take us out of here and, you know, that he's going to rescue us and rapture us from the things that are in the end of the world. If you appear at the judgment seat of Christ, you don't have to appear at the great white throne judgment. When you appear at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to judge your works to see of what kind it is because your sin has already been judged. But that great white throne judgment, that's not the one you want to show up at. And if you read that, uh, towards the end of Revelation, it says the sea, death, and hell gave up their dead, and they were judged out of the books that were there. And everybody whose name was not written in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible said they were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. But any person who has received Christ, the scripture says that the second death has no power over them. So we're not worried about the end. We, we don't have fear about the end. We have confidence in the end because we know in whom we have believed. And just like Job, we said at the last day, 
we're going to see. My re I know my Redeemer lives. And the Redeemer is the one who came and bought back uh, your bondage. The devil had us bound in sin, bound with habits, bound with bad situations. But Jesus came and paid what it took to free us. And because we're free, we don't have to, we don't have to fear the end. And another reason we don't fear the end is because wherever Jesus is, that's where we're going to be. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so when we leave here, we go into the presence of the Lord. Never again to be contaminated with the things that are going on in this world. Now, some people believe, as I close, some people believe that this world is going to go on forever. They just believe, you know, things going to keep going and things going to keep turning and, and, and nothing's going to happen. But I, I, I want to I want to plead with you this evening. Uh, just, just read the scripture earnestly and ask God to reveal it to you. This world, in the direction it's going and the things that are happening, it can't continue to go in this direction. There's no way it can last like this. And the Bible talks about uh, in Daniel's 70 week prophecy, he says that he's going to reveal the Most High and he's going to proclaim an end to all sin. And so sin is going to run its course, but the Lord is absolutely going to bring it to a close and you want to be found in him. And if you're found in him, you have no reason to fear the end. And so we have a love as I close. <laughs> we have a love that is direly different from the world. Uh, it is unique. It is dynamic and it is easy recognizable. So uh, let's look into the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Let's put ourselves to the test, to the litmus test. And anywhere uh, that we're not meeting the mark, let's ask the Lord to help us. And the Lord will help us. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Let's pray. Be dismissed here tonight. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the descriptive terms of love. We thank you that your love is unlike love in the world, but it is unconditional. It is sacrificial. And it is exactly what we needed to write our relationship with you. And then, Father, here is my prayer. My prayer is that love, the love of the saints will prevail in this world. Help us uh, in a time of so much unrest and so much violence and so much anger. Uh, teach us, Lord, to demonstrate the love of God that people would know that you love us and that you love them. Now watch over us. Give us a wonderful evening until we're able to come together again. We ask it all in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. All right, God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.